Oh, we didn't okay. want to do like a crisis right? <laughs> Come on down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. We were debating whether to do like the Price is Right style. Come on down. But Pardon? What order would you like to speak in? I was going to say I could I could set everyone up like from coast to coast, right? Oh, you could. We could we could start in Newfoundland and end in Vancouver. He's he's half an hour later anyway, yeah, so half an hour earlier. <laughs> depends on the perspective, <laughs> right? <laughs> That was how you always knew when CB sh CBC shows were on, right? True. It'd be like 7 o'clock, 7.30 in Newfoundland. <laughs> so, welcome back everyone. I hope everyone's fed and watered and bio braked and everything else and ready to go. Thank you, JP, for that uh, great presentation earlier. And I didn't realize you were a pharmacist, so any a U of A pharmacist like myself. So that was kind of fun to find out. Um, my name is Karen Sullivan, and I am with Shoppers Drug Mart Loblaws, and I'm the Senior Director of Academic and Health System Partnerships. And that's kind of what brings me to this is through our academic partnerships. And I've been asked to moderate this next panel, which I think you'll all find thoroughly engaging and interesting. Um, and it, it really flows nicely out of JP's presentation in that we've got a number of uh, individuals who are involved in different areas of the supply chain across the country, actually, from one coast to the next, literally. And they're going to share some of their experiences and learnings during the pandemic um, as an entity, either public sector, private sector, and the areas they were engaged in and um, what worked really well, what didn't work really well. And then we'll have a question and answer period following that, which JP will also join for. And you'll be able to ask questions um, of any of our panelists. Okay. So I'm just going to introduce everyone with you. And starting, I guess I'll start from east to west. Um, immediately to my right, we have Ron Johnson. And Ron is coming... Uh, the longest, I think, from anywhere from St. John's, Newfoundland, and he's the Vice President of Eastern Health in Newfoundland. Um, Angelique Burke is the CEO, President and CEO of the Canadian Association for Pharmacy Distribution Management. Um, Scott McNair is coming from the other coast, and he's the Executive Vice President of Business Operations with PHS PHSA in Vancouver. And Colonel Natasha Singh is uh, coming to us, I believe. Are you in Ottawa? Ottawa. Yes, yeah. From Ottawa. So we kind of flipped our order around a bit. And she's the Director of Health Services uh, Logistics at the Department of National Defense. And she is also a pharmacist as well by background. So with that, we will start with you, okay. Ron. So thanks, everyone. Um, anyway, I could really... Uh, really uh, sort of uh, feel for JP because I felt the same thing. Uh, so a little bit about Eastern Health. We're the largest integrated health authority in Newfoundland and Labrador. We have a tertiary academic mandate. Uh, we have about 13,000 employees. Our budget is around 1.6 billion. And we have about close to 1,000 doctors. Uh, we are now, for people's interests, we are going, we are doing what Alberta has done. We, we're right now going to create one health authority in the province is currently four there currently. So a little bit about me. So during the pandemic, uh, I, my day job was the VP of Innovation and Rural Health. I, I, I don't have supply chain in my, in my role, in my day job. But during the pandemic, I was commandeered into supply chain. I have a background in it. So I have about 30 years progressive leadership experience in various areas of health. But during the pandemic, I was the logistics chief for Eastern Health. And what that encompassed was sort of managing and uh, the, our supply chain effort for, for largely for Eastern Health, but even for the province as well. So another part was community engagement. I also did the community engagement with our municipalities uh, during 
at COVID, which proved to be a very good thing because it kept our partners informed. And I also managed their private vaccinations, working with our private partners to do vaccinations. So the, what that entailed really uh, is, uh, you know, from managing to controlling PPE was around hazard awareness. So I was a part of the PPE utilization guideline committee for the province on what, de what device to use where. I uh, was heavily involved in PPE utilization, and similar to JP, I think that was our key to success. We quickly developed tools, to uh, analytical tools, to look at burn rate, uh, you know, hot spot areas across the province. That was our key to actually managing this. Uh, I looked after delivery and logistics, which proved to be very, very uh, complicated, as JP indicated. From you know, you'd order stuff, we hired firms to inspect it, it gets stolen on the way, it gets changed, and all these kind of weird stuff, like JP had said in these dark alleys, negotiating deals, hiring planes and trains and automobiles. The other big thing was uh, PPE security. Uh, because of the you know the situation that we we're in, we had to protect and control. It was a huge element around that. And a big thing in Newfoundland was the kindness, managing the kindness, which was proved to be very, very difficult because <laughs> we had donations coming from everywhere and politically it was very difficult to manage because some of the product didn't meet the quality standard. It was a, it was a huge issue. So from a, a challenges uh, perspective, I mean, obviously the market was, was the challenge, right? We were trying to obtain product that wasn't available. We had the GPOs who had contracts, uh, and the GPOs were quite helpful, but couldn't crack the nut either. We all were in the same boat. It was, a, it was an international problem. We did have, you know, in Newfoundland, something remarkable happened. And we had a, we had, when COVID hit in March, of that year when it really started to pick up. We had all these other industry downturning, oil and gas, oil refineries, and everything was, was slowing down. I had a call from, the, uh, from a former uh, finance minister of the province, and she called on, I think it was the 8th of March in 2020, she asked if she could help. And I said, sure. <laughs> we could have put our, wheel, we could have put our PPE in a wheelbarrow then, and <laughs> that's how much we had, right? So. And what she did, there was this massive set of volunteers that amassed from these industries, from oil and gas, who had supply chain, international supply chain experience. And they started procuring on an international basis. And that happened quickly, very, very quickly. It was people, like hundreds of volunteers, they called themselves Task Force NL. We wouldn't have got through it without those volunteers. But as quick as we realized, they realized quickly as well that their efforts were blunted. They weren't achieving. So what we decided to do then, well, really what Task Force NL decided to do, was manufacture, domestic manufacturing. That proved to be the key for us getting through this. We had a, a number of firms that started off very low tech first. Uh, Kathy Bennett, who was the finance minister, sort of uh, used her convening authority. She aggregated all the industrial sowers in the province. Uh, it was almost, it was, I think it was like 500 of these sowers, and they started sewing masks. Some of them, they sold masks made out of the same material you would make a surgical mask out of. That got us through the hump. Then they saw that this, is, this could be something that could turn into an industry. Some of these companies invested in automation. One company in particular, DF Barnes, they, they still have a full automated mask manufacturing facility there. I mean, it allowed us to get through it. Another firm, another company, for instance, geared up and started making shields. This was nine days in, probably around the 20th of March in 2020. They had already had received their Health Canada approval to manufacture shields. So I, I really think that the, we turn these challenges into opportunities. I, I do think going forward, you know, if we are going to not do the same things, like, like I have the unique, uh, I'm in a unique position because in 2011, I was the logistics chief for H1N1 for, for the province. And I, I uh, responded quite well. I bought a lot of PPE. I, I, I created a stockpile and I housed it for a number of years until it became bad and I threw it away. Who else has done that? Right? So here I think we learned something differently, how we can, private with the par how we can partner with the private sector to sort of solve a problem. I don't know, what, I don't know how to sort of keep this capacity that we created domestically. 
but I know we, we have two of our firms now in Newfoundland that are sort of what, the, what they call it, warm stacking or, or warm idling. They're just sitting there waiting. Uh, I do think there is something that can be done. I mean, you know, this could be sort of a tool that sort of matches our stockpiling. It could be another tool where we could use domestic manufacturing for a small portion if the feds would give us some sort of subsidy. I mean, these, these, these organizations are set up now. Like JP had said, it probably is a bit of a procurement exercise to see how many and where and what. But certainly, I think it's something we could do. I think that would help us with resiliency. But to end it, I think, you know, what I've got from the pandemic is, uh, like JP said, supply chain is a lot of things. And really, we got through it because of relationships, partnerships, and kindness. That's it. Thank you. Sorry, Natasha's is next in the Sure. Okay. Thank you, Ron. So, Natasha. Sure. Great. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, it's an honor to be here, and uh, thank you for uh, uh, inviting us all and bringing us together to share some of our stories here. And uh, uh, as JP said, uh, great opening, JP. And and I, I say it as well. You know, the pandemic really shone a light on supply chain, uh, shone a light on on what we do each and every day uh, with our people. And uh, uh, hopefully, we can take that and 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 snowball that into many other things. Uh, so uh, um, I'm from the Provincial Health Services Authority in British Columbia, and, and BC is structured in a way where it has five regional health authorities that deliver um, care within a region within the province, and PHSA runs provincial programs like supply chain, like provincial labs. So, so my role within PHSA is, is business operations. It's a lot of the back office support uh, for a lot of those regional health authorities. And the one thing I think we're, we're proud about in British Columbia is that at times those health authorities can kind of want to do their own thing on certain things. And I think throughout the pandemic, we really rallied and came together. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about our story here. So um, our supply chain team uh, within uh, British Columbia owned 100% of the PPE sourcing and the contracting and the inventory throughout the pandemic. And, and that was really important, I think, uh, because as I mentioned earlier, at times our regional health authorities can kind of go off and do their own thing or even source some product outside of supply chain or outside of our so sourcing team. But throughout the pandemic, they really rallied and we came together because we really did have to have true visibility on our existing uh, products. So, this, as a result of this, it was really an increased dialogue with our health authority partners and also the Ministry of Health. Uh, they played a really big role. And, um, you know, I think the relationships that supply chain established with our leaders within health, within the province, was extremely beneficial. Beneficial in the pandemic, but also beneficial moving outside of the pandemic for a lot of things that we want to accomplish in supply chain. So uh, our supply chain team also supported the vaccination rollout, working with our um, uh, CDC, BC CDC, which is uh, a PHSA program. So that was beneficial in terms of how we partnered and got vaccines out to uh, local pharmacies and to both the public. So we all had challenges and we all had opportunities within, uh, you know, the, the pandemic. And uh, obviously there was, there was a global supply chain issue, a uh, supply issue going on. And I think we all, um, you know, we're going to hear that, uh, that, throughout, uh, I think, a lot of people's stories and, and discussion today. But, you know, it was interesting, right? The, the amount of fraudulent product out in the market during this time was, was unbelievable. And I remember, you know, someone within our supply chain uh, group, they were actually putting the 3M boxes uh, through some type of software, and you could see the actual manipulation of the brand on 3M. You know, 3M has a specific brand. I don't know if it's the, th the three touches the M or, or it's separate, but they could actually tell by looking at the boxes that, you know, we were about to procure that we're actually, we were told that we're coming through a, a, a certified distributor of 3M that they were legit. So there's a lot of, you know, I credit the team for doing a lot of forensics on actually the, the PPE that was coming into to the province. So um, that was really beneficial. And we also did look to some local vendors 
as well. Uh, they, similar to Ron's story, a lot of local vendors stepped up and PP, established some PPE through manufacturing and, and also gowns and things like that. So we did look at using some local uh, vendors. And I think we're all probably facing the challenges around disruptions or critical disruptions. Our, our, our disruption team, our, the disruptions we were actually seeing pre-pandemic during the pandemic were two and a half times. So we actually had to ramp up our critical disruptions team because that's going to continue to be an issue and a problem. And I'm not sure if all of you know this right now, but there's a global shortage on media contrast with General Elect with GE Healthcare. And, and I think that's obviously an opportunity for us. I'll talk about that a little bit later in terms of how we move forward and manage our relationships with our vendors and kind of really try to get upstream a little bit and understand what their supply chains are, are, you know, what's coming out of their supply chains. And I would say that even some of those multinationals that are based here in Canada, um, GE is an example, they don't even know, right? They're, they're trying to fight and not, not fight, but they're trying to get visibility on their own supply chains around the allocation of what's going to happen for, you know, in Canada. So that's, that's something. So one of the other things I'm really proud about during the pandemic is, is our team led a transformation um, around how we could do things differently you know, when we come out of this pandemic. So they were doing all this in their pandemic and they were looking at this transformation. And one of the things that, you know, you, you think you, you, you kind of got it figured out or you think you know what the plan is moving forward. So we, we have five regional health authorities and we have, you know, our centralized warehouse in the lower mainland in Langley. And then all, every one of those regional uh, health authorities wants a warehouse just in case their supplies run out. So, you know, thinking that through, you would think, you know, centralized warehouse, lower mainland distribution hub makes a lot of sense. Why would you have all these little distribution sites? So, I don't know if you recall about a year ago at this time, uh, we had an atmospheric river situation uh, that cut BC off from the rest of, you know, Canada pretty much, right? And there were rail, rail lines were out, um, uh, the highways were out. We had to, you know, so that that warehouse, as an example, in Kelowna, came in really handy uh, to have that that warehouse there. We we got product to that warehouse through through the U.S. or through through air. But sometimes you think the the traditional way of doing things is uh, the right way. But you know, I think you it builds builds into how you're looking at managing things, whether through a pandemic or for future states. So that was something I was really extremely proud about for the team. Um, how do we build some resilience? Are we, how are we gonna to continue to build resilience? So um, GP, JP knows that we're, we're trying to find money for our systems. Uh, and that's one of the things where I think the biggest thing for, for BC um, we need. And, and to give you an example of all that PP that we owned, we, we lost some visibility of our PP once it went out to sort of some rural and sort of smaller acute care hospitals and long-term care hospitals. So trying to manage your PP inventory and understand your usage um, wasn't as easy and I'm not saying it was easy JP I know it's difficult but but we didn't have a system to kind of look at uh, where everything was going and tr from a traceability perspective so that was really uh, difficult and one of the things that I continue to try to tell the team and and I think it's a good message for all of us in supply chain is is that supply chain should be a value center not a cost center Right, and I think some of us that oversee supply chain sometimes report into to CFOs or or people that are overseeing the finances. Um, but how do we create value uh, within um, within supply chain versus just saying, you know, how much does supply chain cost and how much money are you actually saving us? So um, those are sort of some of the critical next steps, and and we're moving forward in innovation and trying to digitize our supply chain, like like many. And uh, those are just sort of some of the steps and our story. And uh, I look forward to chatting with more of you on this today and, and telling more of our story here from BC. So thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, Colonel Natasha Singh, uh, Director of Health Services Logistics with the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, and in interestingly enough, uh, this is a new position. Uh, first uh, pharmacy colonel in decades. Uh, it was something that was actually in the works uh, pre-COVID. 
Uh, but after COVID, it was very much an easy sell to, to stand this up. Uh, we were, and I, you know, previously the, the work or what we call our joint kind of logistics capability and health services fell under very much that CFO type framework along with our, you know, Blue Cross contracts, our Callion contracts and privacy and inform informatics type things. Um, but there's so much there uh, and the emphasis, the requirement is so great that we've been, you know, really dividing up our attention for so long that COVID was a, a great reminder that we need to focus on this area. Um, I was actually in the training realm during COVID, but I'm going to speak in general on the CAF because this is really a, a great opportunity to share kind of what we do, what we can do, uh, because we work with we work with everyone in this room really, um, and, and I'll get into that a little bit more. But uh, uh, really, we did a little bit of everything uh, during the pandemic. So not only did we take care of our own our own members and our own kind of uh, staff in our own health system because we are our own health system. Uh, but we also uh, backstopped a lot of federal government programs and uh, responded to a lot of requests for assistance from the provinces. Uh, you know, so many people in this room uh, certainly benefited from, from having our members deployed to their, their areas. Um, on the supply side specifically, I mean, we were involved in the building of, you know, some, uh, you know, providing some subject matter expertise on how to build a, you know, deployable field hospital uh, for PSPC to, to, you know, have just in case we needed to deploy them. Uh, with internally, we, we stood up, we have, we actually have one warehouse. Uh, so we do have that benefit of having a very good common operating picture, but um, we, we do a lot of just-in-time delivery. That's, that's how our system works. And we have one depot that is really meant just to support deployed operations uh, outside of Canada. Um, and we have a small detachment uh, that uh, holds specific uh, equipment or kits uh, for capabilities such as our uh, disaster assistance uh, response team, the DART kit um, for natural disasters. Uh, so with all the demands that were coming to us, uh, we actually stood up five mini warehouses on a temporary basis across the country in addition to the normal ones so that we could get the, the PPE out. And I mean, it, for those of you that remember very early on in the pandemic, uh, we, resp we responded to RFAs in Ontario and Quebec in the long-term care homes, uh, and we, we sent PPE with our members. Uh, so not only did we go, but we had to provide, uh, you know, the, the stuff to them as well. So it was uh, all, all very fast. We do actually maintain a pandemic stockpile, um, but again, our pandemic stockpile was meant for CAF members for certain situations. And like everyone else, what we had planned for, uh, you know, with our thousands and thousands of doses of Tamiflu and, and all that stuff was not what we got, right? So we, we had enough gloves, masks, gowns uh, for the immediate uh, response. But then like everyone else, we were, you know, ordering in and, and working through our other federal partners to get our stuff in. Um, and again, you know, on the airlifting uh, vaccines for, for uh, PHAC up to northern areas, uh, you know, I think... Uh, um, you know, I've heard we, we helping, you know, move vaccines and fridges to other parts of the communities as well, or more remote communities where, uh, you know, FedEx just wasn't going to cut it, perhaps. And then, uh, of course, you know, we're not just in Canada, we're all over the world. Uh, so our supply chain was, was not just, you know, get things to these, you know, 44 uh, bases within Canada or locations within Canada. It was providing things like vaccines uh, to our deployed members uh, and partnering with, you know, uh, you know uh, Global Affairs Canada to make sure that their people in these remote locations could be vaccinated as well. So not only sending the stuff, uh, but also administering. And, and anecdotally, I can tell you, my, my husband was recently deployed to Q8 um, and... Uh, I, when we were doing the booster shots and uh, they were, they were, you know, they landed in Lebanon on the back of a Herc and we're vaccinating people on the back, back of the Herc for global affairs. So we are, we are very adept at, at coming up with very unique solutions to legal uh, regulatory problems and, and supply chain issues. Uh, that's, that's what we do best. And I, that's, you know, I think why we, we, we were so heavily involved in this. Um, and the challenges are very, very much the same as everyone else. I, I mean, we have a we have a population of a not quite sixty five thousand regular force members, uh, and uh, another you know twenty thousand or so uh, reserve force members that are spread across the country and, and on deployed operations. So uh, our attention was very much split during the pandemic. 
Um, uh, but we don't we don't get overtime, so uh, we we had the benefit of, of having a a uh, workforce population that was uh, readily on hand and and willing to do whatever they could uh, during the pandemic. Um, and really, same again, the, the quality and the, the challenges of the PPE uh, was certainly something that we noticed and it's something that we're, we're continuing to monitor as we go through our stockpile right now. Uh, I would say about half of some of the things that we received uh, when we put them through our own quality testing did not do not meet the IPAC standards that, that we had hoped for. So uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing process and one that I'm sure is not uh, soon to end. Uh, and again, uh, same as everyone else, lots of opportunities coming uh, from this. Uh, in, in my perspective, I think this is actually uh, a great opportunity uh, coming out of some very difficult times. Um, but uh, as the Canadian Armed Forces, we, we have been dealing with some very unique challenges. Uh, we deal with products that aren't necessarily widely used or available in Canada, whether it's for you know, uh, combat first aid situations or response to chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear uh, countermeasures. Uh, so we invest a lot of time in actually uh, getting products uh, licensed and, and, and brought to market within Canada ourselves and then stockpile them uh, so that they are available on short notice uh, in the case of emergencies. Um, and so the more people that know about these types of issues, the, be the easier it makes our job, uh, to be completely honest. Because uh, it's, it's a problem that's not going to go away, as we all know. Uh, and uh, I, again, you know, when I'm talking about the domestic, uh, uh, like the manufacturing capability that we're hoping to see online, um, without, uh, without having things made in Canada, certainly it, uh, it, it, it increases the risk for everyone. You either stockpile it, which we all know costs a lot of money and a lot of time to bring it, or you risk it not being able to come across the border uh, when things actually get hairy, and these are things that we've actually experienced uh, in, in our in our workspace uh, over the years. Um, you know, I've, I've, I was asked to kind of identify some things that I think are critical moving forward, and, and I think it's really uh, a, a repeat, which I'm really glad to hear of a lot of the things that have already come up. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, we, we've talked about stockpile management and for us, you know, applying a, a due diligence and relooking at how we do it, uh, whether it's, you know, creating contracts with manufacturers to hold our goods and, and life cycle, uh, manage them on our behalf, uh, just looking for unique ways, ways to do this and improve how we do business to, uh, you know, as, as a government agency, our, our, our financing is, is limited, uh, of course, so how can we do this in a more effective and efficient manner? Uh, and hopefully, you know, we'll gain some lessons learned from people here as well. Um, infrastructure. Uh, we talked about the warehousing issue, right? So we have one warehouse, as I said, uh, which makes it very difficult if we have to respond to something very quickly. How do we get stuff out to Edmonton? And so that was the, the FMED on the temporary basis, but certainly we're looking at our kind of our capital infrastructure uh, on a on a future, you know, with a future view on, on what should this look like moving forward. And that includes things like freezers, fridges, right? So, uh, and then, you know, continuing to work with our industry partners. So, so we have a list of priority items that we identify that we, that we work to bring to market. And I mean, I think one of the most recent examples uh, that everyone is tracking is, you know, the, the monkeypox that, that we've had in Canada. The Invimmune was a product that we worked with PHAC to bring to market. Uh, I want to say about 2015, I believe, um, uh, for our smallpox uh, stockpile in CAF. So, I mean, uh, you know, thanks to our efforts, you know, hopefully the provinces and the territories are, are benefiting from access to those, uh, those vaccines right now. Uh, it's much easier to distribute something, as we all know, if it's, if it's Health Canada licensed. Uh, you know, if you're trying to rush through that process at the last minute, that's, you know, where we, we've seen all these... Uh, these concerns and conflicts arrive. So uh, we're looking forward to working with people to, to do more of that moving forward. And I think that's it. And I mean, I, where I'm, I'm going to be involved with Christian in the security working group uh, later this afternoon. But I mean, I think this picture is just profound uh, in, in the example of how uh, difficult this is. This is actually our Central Medical Equipment Depot and two of our pharmacists there, Major Cecilia Reyes and Captain Chelsea Thorne, uh, receiving uh, our first shipment of uh, calf vaccine in December 2020, and it, it was escorted by, you know, the uh, the OPP.
at the time, like this is serious business, right? So these are things that we need to think, uh, think about moving forward. So uh, that's it for me now, but I uh, look forward to, th to talking to you all later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Snowden, and thank you, Karen, for moderating this panel and asking me to be part of it. I was hoping I wasn't going to follow Colonel Singh, but <laughs> here I am. And my name is Angelique Berg, and I'm President and CEO at CAPTAM, the Canadian Association for Pharmacy Distribution Management. Please all learn it <laughs> before we change it. <laughs> I joined uh, CAPTAM, which is the nation's trade association for um, the pharmacy supply chain in Canada. I joined um, within the pandemic. It was really interesting. I had been working on Health Canada's Drug Shortages Unit multi-stakeholder committee on drug shortages at the time uh, with the with the uh, health charity that I was leading at the time. And when that health charity decided to go a different direction, I wanted to stay involved in this. I could not believe how cool the supply chain was. So for all of you and JP, anybody who thought you were nerdy supply chain people, I'm so happy to be among you. <laughs> I can't believe the power that's within it. I can't believe the opportunity that we can change. I can't believe the opportunity we have to strengthen the network. And kudos to Anne for doing this. Nobody else is looking at it and it's high time. So congratulations. Congratulations to you and thank you for inviting us here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about the pharmacy uh, distribution supply chain and I did ask for some indulgence because as JP said and everyone else has said, nobody really understands this. No one understands until your drugs aren't getting to you. And Much like the electricity grid, as long as your light switch turns the lights on, nobody cares. Right. Um, but as soon as your drugs can't get to you, everyone's asking questions. So we're peeling back the drywall a little bit today and, and uh, giving you a little bit of an overview of that. So this is a very simple depiction of the pharmacy, pharmaceutical supply chain today. It's not going to get into the complexities. You can find all kinds of gaping holes here, but essentially this is giving you the primer. We source most of our raw material outside Canada, way outside Canada. Um, and sometimes they're manufactured into excipients or to active pharmaceutical ingredients and then shipped to other manufacturing sites. Some are in Canada, but only 30% of the drugs that are consumed here are actually made here, which is really important. So we're relying heavily on imported product. Finished product uh, goes into packaging then. Um, what is not shown here is the supply chain for all of those packaging components from the glass, from the lip stoppers to the glue that you stick it, uh, label, labels on with. Distribution is the sector that I represent. Um, we handle 95% of all prescription drugs in Canada move through our members, and I'll get to those in a second. So again, that's 95%, not just to hospitals, but also to pharmacies across the country. And then we go into dispensing. Those are our hospitals and our pharmacies. And we finally get to the patients. So again, this is a really simple view, um, but it does represent the, the flow of things here. What is not on here is how it's moved. So we're missing the little boats and the planes and the trains and the trucks. And those are other, um, you know, the other, other stakeholders that are really important. So what we'll get into next is taking a more narrow view on the supply chain within Canada and its stakeholders within. So we have hundreds of manufacturers, three to 400 pharmaceutical manufacturers are in Canada, whether that is just one person office working out of their basement like we all did in COVID, or there are you know, hundreds of, hundreds of uh, in, in individual strong as well as sales forces. They work either directly with distributors or they will work through third-party logistics houses. And these, these people are really important because they do the outsourcing for manufacturers. Essentially, their warehousing and their, and their transportation. Distrib distributors handle over 15,000 SKUs. So that's all dosage forms. About 15,000 SKUs, and that's a, to the tune of about a $30 billion product portfolio, the value of it. And there are four um, channels there that I'll get to in a second, but they all reach 11,500 points of dispensation, so from the pharmacies and the hospital. So distribution is a really important piece. We're important middlemen. Um, if you had hundreds of manufacturers going to 11,500 points of uh, distribution, you can just imagine the mayhem and, and chaos that would erupt. So distribu distributors streamline and, uh, and bring, um, bring order to the chaos. So those channels are primary wholesalers, um, which will distribute to any pharmacy and any hospital across the country. 
We call them, we call the next category self-distributing pharmacy change, which is a little bit goofy to say shoppers. Oh. And you know, gamma <laughs> shoppers, London Drugs um, and Gamma Warehouse. Um, they, are, um, they are distributors who deliver to their own pharmacies. Then we have specialized distributors. Specialized distributors, um, they will distribute to their own cl own clinics and they have a really high touch program. So think infusion, infusion type clinics. There's an alternative channel, uh, CPDN. It's the Canadian Pharmaceutical Distribution Network. And they are a select channel that bypasses distribution and goes directly from manufacturer with a flash sale at the third party logistics house and goes into, into hospitals across the country. What that does is it allows better visibility all along the supply chain from manufacturer to endpoint. So what this distribution system does is it brings you, this is all the regulations and capacity. There are a whole lot of barriers to entry into this market. Um, in the pandemic, we had a number of trucking companies that really desperately wanted to join Captum and move pharmaceutical product, but these are all the barriers to entry. Um, it's, it's not a simple thing. All of the wholesale, all of the um, distributors uh, for both medical devices and, uh, sorry, for pharmaceuticals as well as medical devices and some OTC products are subject to these acts and regulations. And from those acts and regulations come this really lovely list of licenses that they uh, need to adhere to. And what that creates is infrastructure and technology that really can't be duplicated very easily. Um, you'll see precursor cages, narcotic vaults, some of them at their, at their, their the, uh, composition of the narcotic vaults depends on the illicit value of the product. So you might have several feet of concrete required around a um, certain product. Not real quick things to do. Cold chain um, became frozen chain in the pandemic. So ultra frozen right up to minus 60 degrees Celsius. These, this, this required in those distributors installation of, these, um, of, these, uh, of the te technology to be able to handle the changing products. So not only do they have to be able to handle them, they also have to be able to transport them. And this is where I said the barrier to entry for trucking companies is pretty high. Not only do you have to be able to maintain those temperatures in your reefers and in your trucks, but you also have to prove it. So you have to prove that that temperature was maintained all along, along the way. And the capacity, as I mentioned, there are um, 37 distribution centers across Canada. Unfortunately, that's probably cut in by a third in the last 10 years. Um, 8,000 employees right now um, carrying 15,000 SKUs and a short-term buffer stock. And that's a really important aspect of the pharmaceutical supply chain system is that buffer stock. Product distribution, I mentioned it was valued at over $30 billion. That's a really gigantic number, but that is not what the distributors are paid, and that, I'll get to that in a second as well. Um, they are responsible for inventory turnover and evergreen inventory turnover. This is what they do. They know how to do this, get rid of it so before it expires. Deliver next day from coast to coast. Um, we provide that short-term short -term buffer, which is, again, it's a very important thing because drug management of drug shortages identification of substitution, where's my product coming from? It's a humongous piece that, um, that distributors deal with every day. They execute drug recalls and returns. And then importantly, they also implement manufacturer-directed allocations and supply, supply chain disruption or shortages. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is a deliberate slowing of the supply chain when a product is going into shortage position. It shows, slows everything down. There are a number of ways to implement allocations. We can say you're only going to get 70% of the order that you, um, that you put in, or it's going to redirect things into hospitals first and then community pharmacy later. There's a number of different ways to do it. What's important to note is this is in the hands of the manufacturer. The manufacturer directs it, um, and that's a really important thing. Manufacturers know their market. They know who's dispensing these. They know, know what patients are taking them, and they're a really important player in that, and they direct it. Product flow, top to bottom. Order flow, bottom to top, basically the same. Well, I recently made a presentation to... Um, Health Canada Group, and um, order flow was the hardest thing to get across. People didn't understand how orders were placed and then how they were filled. So um, what I'm learning that I, that, oh, wow. So 
the, um, these are our members right now, so primary wholesale distributors. And I put these up here, hope you don't mind their logos and this branding, but people don't know who these people are, right? You don't know who the middlemen are, you don't know what's behind the drywall when you peel it back. And these are the critical players in our, um, in our supply chain. Um, from primary wholesale distributors, um, our pharmacy chains and specialty distributors to third party pharma, log pharma logistics providers. This is not an exhaustive list, but essentially all the cool kids are in the tents. Um, everybody who's anybody is here, and uh, we're really proud of the, of the strength of our, of our supply chain in Canada. So when we think about, I'm sorry, I'm going, you want me to stop? Okay, so, um, one of the, the takeaways over the pandemic um, that, we, that we identified was planning for demand. There's been a lot of talk about that. At the, early on in the pandemic, we ran into a shortage or a shift um, on salbutamol inhalers. Um, they were found that you know, kids with asthma were using these inhalers, and they also were really effective um, medical devices for in, in um, hospital use. Um, what happened was manufacturers implemented an allocation because there was a shortage slowing down the supply chain and redirected the um, salbutamol inhalers. There was a huge conversation and collaboration among the GPOs and manufacturers and the distributors to say, is this this ethical to put them all into the hospitals and, and deplete the community. That kind of collaboration is really important. Likewise, on propofol, which is so wonderful, um, but propofol went into shortage position, surgeries were cut, and that, that conversation had to happen about what surgeries were going to go forward and which were not. Um, the, that kind of com uh, the, the planning, the collaboration was really important. And when we look forward from what we've what we experienced over the pandemic, we need to take a holistic, realistic, longer term view. JP had mentioned that um, that as people in supply chain rely on their partners to figure out global demand. We Canada is a really small market in a very large global marketplace. We account for approximately 2% of global demand. We're not a big market. We're not an attractive market because we don't like to pay for products. And it's really difficult to get drugs here. So we have to be realistic about what's possible. When we're looking for alternatives to, to single source drugs, that's a big part of it. We're part of a global marketplace. We're on that world stage trying to fight for our 2% at really cheap prices. We need to plan for those demand shifts, and in order to do that, we need to share data across the supply chain, which Anne's project is starting to do. And we also need to consider the cost to serve. We can't continue to do everything for everybody without breaking the bank, and we need to think hard about that as well. Leveraging the asset of the infrastructure that exists is another takeaway. Um, for several years, CAPTAM members through a consortium approach have been deploying provincial flu vaccines, vaccine seasons for a number of years in a number of different provinces. And yet, when we got into bringing the vaccines in for COVID, it was almost like an outside structure was built in order to do that. Rather than leveraging what was happening, what happens on a day-to-day -day basis with these expertise, with the, um, with the capacity and all of the regulations, everything in set, it went outside. So that was a sacrifice. It was sacrificed. Everybody watched it happen. Everyone was turning on a dime. So you can't really fault anybody in it, except you can fault us. You can fault the trade association and members for not coming out really hard and saying, this is what we do, folks, every day on a day-to-day -day basis. We need to provide more education and awareness to people so that they know how to partner with us. And what we hope comes from this are those government private sector partnerships that really make use of the asset that we have in Canada. Because quite honestly, if we don't use it, we'll lose it. And you have to think about that. It is to leverage the asset that we have is the most cost-effective, efficient, and secure solution. This is the expertise that we bring to the table. Finally, about using it or losing it, we need to invest for sustainability. For all of the, all of the capacity and all of the network across the country, uh, we work in a very controlled environment. The drug prices um, and their upcharge are controlled by, um, by either the government directly or agencies of the government. And distribution funding is a factor of the drug price. So we have an artificial ceiling or a controlled ceiling, and then we have also an artificial or controlled percentage that you can take for distribution, which makes it very difficult. Funding for distribution has been eroded significantly, especially since 2007. Lower drug prices are good for everybody, right? Everybody wants that, but the indirect cost of that is that it erodes the funding for distribution. Generic drug prices fell by 70% in 2007. 
And the PMPRB guidelines that were just released are expected to have another 6% impact higher than, uh, than we thought when we did these slides up. And um, operating costs continue to rise. The regulations continue to rise, which is good for Canadians. It's good for safety and it's good for security. Um, but those operating costs continue to rise in regulation. Automation and innovation. We want to have a world-class um, distribution network. That takes, it takes money. And product in innovation is also driving a lot of the investment that's required. There weren't minus 60 frozen requirements a long time ago. Right now, just like everybody else, we're all struggling with inflation fuel, labor rates and labor shortages, which aren't uh, cheap things to do. And there are few options to remedy this shortfall. And I'll tell you from a personal perspective, as the president and CEO of Captum, this is what keeps me up at night. If we don't do something to remedy the funding for this sector, it will have a significantly a negative impact to patients right now. The reason being is we are going to every single pharmacy in Canada on a daily basis. That is incredibly expensive. When you think about how much you might pay for your cardiovascular drugs or your lipid lowering drugs or what have you, we're moving, to, moving things to Fort St. John, BC or Conception Bay, Newfoundland at a loss. And that is a huge conundrum right now. There are very few levers that distributors can, can pull in order to make up for that shortfall. It's either sacrifice delivery frequency or sacrifice delivery lanes. It's come down to that. So Captum is right now working very hard to advocate to try and find a different funding solution and uh, to make sure that we do the right things for patients in Canada and that we do the right things as ethical and purveyors of our, of our pharmaceutical um, market. And that's where we are. That's what we're working on next. So thank you to all of you for your presentations and insights on learnings from the pandemic. So I'd like to um, kind of open it up to the floor now to see if anyone has any questions that they'd like to put forward for any of our panelists. And JP, you're in the hot seat too, if anyone's got questions mm -hmm. for you. I just found it interesting that only once in the conversation was ethics mentioned. Mm -hmm. Values and ethics of, of the work that we're doing. And, and I, Maybe just a conversation about that would be Yeah, a very interesting point that you bring up. Yeah, no, it is very interesting because, and I, I may actually throw that back to you because, like, within the context even of, of vaccines, because, you know, Natasha, you mentioned how the security was there when they were initially rolled out, but that was a big piece of um, the start of the rollout of vaccines as well, was that, that ethical piece is, you know, in terms of who's first in the queue. And I think, and, and that applied, you know, to other, I, I, other items in the supply chain, even, you know, when PPE was short, who's, who's getting PPE and who's not, or where is it going, where isn't it going? So I don't know who wants to take that and first. I mean, and I I can speak first while everyone else gathers their thoughts, perhaps, but uh, from a CAF perspective, I mean, we, we have internal to us um, public health uh, trained physicians and epidemiologists and experts, and we actually stood up... Um, a, uh, a group, a working group uh, that was really providing COVID intelligence um, to us on that kind of uh, public health aspects of, uh, you know, working in conjunction with all the official, like all the other boards, like the National Advisory um, Co Committee for Immunization and, and all those other groups. But uh, from a CAF perspective, we were, we had, we had to release very clear rules, you know, to the clinics on on who, who got vaccine first, why they got vaccine first. Um, and, and ours was influenced obviously by operational priorities. If you were deploying soon, you were a priority because we, we didn't know ethically like what we were putting, you know, were you going to be in increased harm's way if you were overseas? Um, but in general, we followed the, the published guidelines for, you know, those with increased risk uh, were, were first in the queue. Um, but, but it was something that actually required the stand-up of a second committee or like you know an independent committee to help influence these decisions on on who got what and who could do what because it was such a um such a foundational aspect of the work that we were doing we had similar from an ethical perspective mm -hmm. even on ppe usage usage especially in the beginning like i can remember one decision uh in the beginning when we gave every nurse uh, two masks mm. when they came to work in the morning 
and that's all I had for the whole day. And, and so I remember the ethics around doing these ethics consults on it. But I, I do think that some of those decisions we made then is contributing to our health human resource issues now. Mm -hmm. Scott? Yeah, I would just say similar. We we had it set up so with those different regions that I referenced is that, you know, everybody got a certain amount of, of, of PPE, especially. And, and that was through just the collaboration and ongoing dialogue that was going on. I can honestly say that no health authority felt they, they didn't have anything, right? I think there was probably times they were worried. <laughs> um, but there was, you know, everybody had a sufficient amount. And I think the, where, where things changed in BC a little bit, and I'll use the rapid antigen test uh, as an example, is we, BC for a long period of time did not, I don't know, if, was, was not a proponent of the rapid antigen test. For a long period of time, we stuck with PCR. And under public pressure last fall, probably around December, we opted to, to, to start to bring them into the, to the province. And that's when it actually got really sort of crazy because everybody wanted it, right, and wanted access to it. And then you started to look at our rural and remote communities within BC, which are really hard to get to. So um, we stood up another sort of type of committee that looked at the different segments for distributing the, uh, the rapid antigen tests. And uh, it was positive. And I think what you take out of all of this is if you can get all the key people and key stakeholders to the table, and there's visibility on what's coming in, what's going out, you can get to that equity piece versus just keeping behind the curtain and just saying, okay, you get that, you get this, and we're gonna distribute it that way. And we were all doing this with, with you know, our systems are not are archaic, right? Again, BC, we've got six different systems to, to track inventory. So uh, it's, a, it's a great point and, and one that we, um, we looked at from a, from an ethics point of view as well. So, but thanks for bringing it forward. Uh, sorry, um, thank you so, so much for sharing all this with us. So I have two questions. One is about collaboration. We have a study and, and in the previous project with Anne, we, we, we evaluated the um, contribution of collaboration to the supply chain surplus in BC. And we found actually moving also I thought I actually have. Okay, thank you. So um, the first question is about collaboration. And uh, we evaluated the um, uh, effect of moving from de uh, decentralized to vendor managed inventory system in BC during the pandemic. And we found actually that could have really contributed about 25, 21% of su supply chain surplus that can be shared between vendors and buyers if we just move and change the policy of managing inventories just for, and if you take it for one item, that is millions of dollars. So why we don't really try also to move in that direction and then save in, in many ways? And the second question is about this tribal hubarism, how we can address the problem that we see in these kind of, even actually in this room, um, and that's what we have observed even in during the pandemics. Yes, people came together but as you can see very quickly after the pandemic, we went back to the normal. Um, so how we can change actually the, the, the incentives within the system to be able to encourage um, this kind of now uh, boundaries to come down between different organizations? Why don't you take that one first, Ashley? Um, thanks for the question. As um, you know, actually, as you were responding, Scott, about the distribution of the rapid antigen test kits, um, that was a really great example of collaboration between government and uh, and private sector. Um, it was it was the uh, captain members that actually deployed those uh, the delivery of the rapid antigen test kits and, and got them through. Um, but it's a great question because there there are so many um, there's so many reasons not to collaborate. Um, and yet, when you start to reach across desks and reach, reach across Zoom calls, um, you can see those the opportunities for collaboration. I really think they're coming. Um, I'd like to give credit to Canada's Multi-Stakeholder Committee on Drug Shortages. They were phenomenal stewards and phenomenal facilitators of information, of bringing people together. As painful a lot of those calls were, um, it was phenomenal how quickly people came together. And that, that group is still running. Um, that group is still doing work. And uh, I think a lot of those pieces, a lot of those key pieces are still going to continue and hopefully we'll grow from there. Okay. Anyone else have any? 
a comment on it? I mean, I, I can maybe speak to the vendor manage inventory piece, and I, and I think that, um, you know, that occurs. There's also on-site consignment in, in the cath lab and other areas as well, and I think that's beneficial. But I think there, as long as there's a way to track that and trace it and, and look at are you ensuring that the right amount of volume is coming in and going out, what is needed, uh, I think is something... And for someone that doesn't have, we don't have the systems to, to maybe do that, and it's a little bit manual, uh, so it's difficult. Um, but but I, I think the important part is on the collaboration piece is I look at the vendor relationship and the vendor management to get to a point that that is, and I mentioned it in my sort of, in, in sort of my speaking notes there, it was like, how do we get upstream in the manufacturers or distributors? supply chain right and look at it from that perspective but i think there's opportunities as well and i think the vendors would would you know appreciate that as well i think there's throughout this pandemic it's been referenced a number of times that the relationship with the vendor is as hard as maybe it was for a vendor to say yeah you're getting 10 every 10 every day and now you're getting zero like there was everybody was in crisis mode but i, I think there's as we've gone through our own transformation journey with supply chain, that the relationship with vendors can be better. Any other? Good morning. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, JP touched on engagement and how it changed engagement, and, and, and yourselves have, have uh, explained the difficulties you've had um, throughout the pandemic from a supply perspective. Do you and your organizations have plans to retrospectively now look where you weren't aligned with other provinces because there was no standard to any of these responses? So even from a staffing perspective, I have staff across the, the prairie regions from, from Saskatchewan to BC, different requirements for entering a building in each of the five or six sites that I manage, different requirements for delivering blood to hospitals, different requirements for masking, not masking, for, for visitors coming, for not visitors coming, for who can work from home, who can get what, who, you know, all of those things were, were completely different depending where you were. Is there a plan to, to retrospectively look at what was the best practice, the best practice, and then that formalizes part of the, the future plans for these? I hope that makes sense. The <laughs> I mean, I, I can speak to that. I, I you know, I, I, it, it's a great question, and you would you would think that, you know, whether it's the the the, you know, the western provinces or you know the country, it's tough because it's even tough in my own province to get the health authorities and the, the everybody rallying around, you know, and collaborating to get together. Mm -hmm. um, so so that's like. But if I look at the rapid antigen example that I referenced, the feds really stepped up and actually took it, it, you know, drove that initiative across the country. Like, I mean, I'm just like, we're just getting rapid antigen to tests coming in. I mean, probably getting too much now, to be honest with you, but like, I've like put the brakes on now, but I didn't have to worry about it. I didn't have to know when it was coming in. It was just, I had to find warehouse space for it. So I think, I think there's a, I and mean, some of us have talked about this on some other conferences, is that if there was a federal type of initiative on sort of this and, a, and an incentive for us to work, you know, not better together, but just be more aligned, I think it would be beneficial. Because I think depending on how your province is structured, I mean, Ontario is fragmented, right? You've got different groups, uh, you know, procuring product and sourcing product, but um, it's tough. It's tough. I mean, when I get when I get my own province collaborating and really aligned, then maybe we'll start to go. But but there are examples where I think we we can come together on certain things. One of the issues, you know, <clears throat> there's been a lot of attempts over the years, especially in the Atlantic Canada for the four Atlantic provinces to cooperate, and we try, uh, but the piece is missing is a coordinating mechanism and apparatus. There's no apparatus to do it, right? And that's most times the attempts to try fail <laughs> without that. Yeah. I'm just, I'm smiling at your comment on the PPE because I think it, it applied to Paxlovid as well. Because I remember getting a call from the guys at Fraser Health saying, can you please take some Paxlovid? Because we're swimming in it. We've got another <laughs> shipment coming in next week. Freeing up some space in my warehouse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got a couple questions here. So we've got one in the back. You've got the mic first. And Go ahead. You've got Mike. Yeah, I mean, that's a classic administrative federalism problem. Germany does that well, yeah. this coordinating among different mechanisms. We do it terribly. And there's, I think, 
institutional cultural reasons, but there are, there are federations that manage to do it. Um, three observations, I thought Ron's observation was really interesting about sort of subsidiarity, right? That we, it, it, the local units and the local connections and local networks actually really mattered in order to be able to re respond expeditiously to local, uh, to local demand. Um, I personally thought there was also a significant failure of the federal government. So D&D used to run until about 20 years ago, a very small audit office that kept the capacity of, uh, kept track of industrial capacity around the country. So if you ever needed to surge capacity, they knew where everything was in the country basically to make just about anything. And so if you needed something, but then we decided 20 years ago to abandon it. And so there's no centralized mechanism in Canada that actually keeps track of what capacity there is and how could you retool it. Um, and so I think one of the interesting debates for me coming out of this is would it actually be useful for D&D or some other entity that's need to be in D&D to actually pick that back up given the supply chain issues and the very uncertain world sort of that we live in. And so how do we balance the subsidiarity on the one hand where we really want to work with localities and provinces in terms of the strengths that they can bring the way Ron outlined it, uh, the kind of Newfoundland sort of spirit and the, the need for sort of economies of scale that a federal government can bring in terms of like, we need to get this done, we need to get it done now, here are the places that can actually do it. And I thought also Angelique's comment was really interesting that nobody seemed to have the wherewithal to talk to her group when it came to the vaccine rollout, because I think, I mean, I don't want to speak sort of out of turn here, and Natasha, you can correct me, but there were a number of people, I think, in uniform scratching their heads about why the Canadian Armed Forces is distributing vaccine across this country. And I think there was sort of sympathy for the fact there's some places that are really hard to reach. And so, yes, that's a military task. Um, but I think there was sort of uh, some in terms of civil military relations that I, I personally thought there was a significant breakdown here um, where, you know, this is something that, you know, in a democracy, in reasonable normal times, we're not in a war or so, this is something that presumably the civilian sector should have been able to do. And it was sort of the, um, I think the worry that some senior journalists have also expressed before committee, the Kenyan Armed Forces becoming sort of the easy button. Every time the federal government wants to do something, we just go with the Kenyan Armed Forces because we own them, we own the liability, we'll just get them to do it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and so given that constraints the Kenyan Armed Forces are having that you're all aware of, uh, I just think there might be some opportunity for conversation here about we need to be able to do better to engage, I think, with civil society on like, does the military really need to do this or is there actually other ways to do something? I think actually on that on that point, it, it, it does bear some um, some clarity. If we think back about how difficult it was to procure, procure the vaccines and get them here, I'm not sure the military there, that there was anybody else that could have done it with the sort of security and efficiency that the military could do. But the ongoing part of it was what was difficult. Um, it was a it wasn't a factor of people being. Um, intentionally exclusionary or anything of the sort. It was just not knowing. We don't know what we don't know. So when you put out RFPs for things that people do, um, you know, it's a matter of course, their day-to-day -day business, um, and they don't see it, they don't know where to put those RFPs out, no one knows where to find them, that becomes really difficult. So it's a better collaboration, better better awareness, and it's on us. We have to do it. Um, but I think the, I do think the military did a killer job at the security and the deployment. I'm sure they did. <laughs> I know they did. But, but no, I mean, I mean, this is interesting. And, and I mean, I think this speaks to the need to have somebody from PSPC here, maybe perhaps yes, on the yes. procurement side. Um, I tried. Oh, you did? Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but, but, you know, where we're looking at federal versus provincial contracts and, and where is their economy of effort, you know, uh, I mean, I know even... Uh, my old shop was providing specifications for ventilators that yeah. that PHAC could then just jump on board so we're not duplicating effort. And I have a feeling we duplicated a lot of effort throughout the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of back to the point about a need for some sort of coordinating entity or office. What people forget is Canadian Armed Forces has eight missions under our current defense policy. And the last of those missions is domestic operations. And this is not a resource mission. So every time the Canadian Armed Forces does domestic operations, they have to pull people out of other operations, out of training, people who are off on leave. So it's 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 a huge strain on this small organization. And there, there are pre-existing public organizations with cold, frozen, and warm chain solutions. Uh, I work for Canadian Blood Services. And you talk about security, which is done of shaking my head. I, I, I would find a rare blood unit, one of its type in the world, as valuable and is uh, shipped with equal security 
to, to a shipment of a vaccine. So I, I believe the security is there. We just we didn't leverage existing partnerships or, or existing publicly funded supply chains. Okay. And last question. Yeah. So uh, fascinating conversations around that. My just as a. I guess as a side, my job is uh, the Director of Program Policy for the COVID-19 vaccine rollout with the Public Health Agency of Canada. So I, I'm absolutely fascinated to have some of these conversations. I, I couldn't agree more. And some of the things that I really am excited about from the panel's perspective, we've had a lot of observations over the last two and a half years from, from my group. And one of the reasons we were very excited to to partner with Anne, because we don't necessarily have some of the levers to bring forward a number of the things that we've observed and that we would like to see um, have some greater discussion. One of the things that comes out of this and definitely came out of the, uh, the presentation earlier is the visibility piece, I think, for us, whether it be the information technology, the track and trace capacity, the, the ability to see what you have. Um, and where it is. And I think from the vaccine rollout perspective, what we saw was that we brought the vaccines into the country. We had them centrally. We passed them through our distribution to provinces and territories from coast to coast to coast out to places in you know, other countries. But once it got there, we had no visibility on it. And I, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn when I say for a number of the jurisdictions, once it left your central warehouse, you had no visibility of it as well. Um, and because of that, that, that ability to see where things are, it made it very difficult to come into what is my next point, demand planning. Um, we're, we're all now in a situation where we have stockpiles that we're going to be looking at, vaccine, PPE, other you know, ancillary supplies and those kinds of things. And we're, we're working really closely with provinces and territories to minimize the, the cost to the taxpayer and to the patients um, because we have we have supplies sitting in our central warehouse, you have supplies in yours, the provincial, the territorial warehouses. How do we how do we make sure that we're getting these supplies into the system in an appropriate time? And how do we make sure that we're backfilling that? And if we're going to talk about establishing more stockpiles or better stockpiles across the country, how do we do demand planning? Because the consistent ordering 5% more than I ordered last year, or my budget's dropped 20%, so I need to... That's not necessarily demand planning, it's fiscal planning. Um, and are we providing the best benefit for Canadians and you know the just-in-time treatment for our patients that we've been talking about? And so I guess they're the two pieces that I've taken away from this multi-sectorial collaboration. And, and I'm wondering whether, whether you feel like those are things that we can address within this group and whether whether I don't know any anything else that that you would see that fits into those uh, you articulated it beautifully <laughs> yeah I mean it is demand it, it's fiscal planning that's all it is it's like your budget's this your budget's flat so what are you going to do about it or how are you going to save money it's not true demand planning you start to look at you know increased caseloads in the OR, you know, to kind of, I don't know, how do you demand plan for your supplies to get there? Like that's demand, true demand planning. That's true supply chain management. And if we're being honest, healthcare is a little bit behind the times in terms of just, you know, it's true supply chain. But you, that's, that's a great, I never heard that analogy of around demand planning versus fiscal, but that's exactly what it is. Is that exactly what it is? Yeah. And, and ironically, I think that's sort of how we've planned our human resource. Mm -hmm. supply chain when it comes to healthcare, which has gotten us into big, big trouble, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Economic downturn, we have less money, so we lay off nurses, mm -hmm. which is which is when oh, yeah. we should probably need more. <laughs> uh, anyway, don't go, won't go down that rabbit hole. So no, no, no. anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just give us an hour. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so, anyone else have any other... Just in, in response to that, um, I, I agree. Those are amazing observations, and they're really keen observations. Um, one thing I would I would ask all the provinces is, why do you have warehouse space? Um, we do have an infrastructure that is built right to do this. Why do you have your own warehouse space? Why do you have your own distribution systems? It, it, 
you're duplicating. Um, so we could be fortifying um, the very system that takes all the stuff you're holding in your own warehouses out to the 11,500 dispensing <coughs> points across Canada. You could be putting it into that system that already exists and fortifying it and then holding, holding them accountable. Yeah. Or you could duplicate it. That's yeah. a good point. And Absolutely great point. Yeah, Union, and I, unionized labor in warehouses is a pretty yeah. big one in, in our yeah. province. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a big you know, challenge rather but than I, outsourcing it. Yeah. I would add to Angelique's comment too is that with greater interprovincial cooperation and collaboration, um, knowing those resources are there could help significantly with disaster management as well. And I think, Scott, when you mentioned the floods about a year ago, um, for us as organizationally, we distribute for Western Canada out of Calgary. Mm -hmm. All the other pharmacy operators distribute out of Vancouver. Mm -hmm. So it created some interesting dynamics because for our network, we were cut off from the lower mainland. We could get everywhere else great. Yeah. And the other distributors couldn't get to the rest of the province. Um, and so, you know, knowing those resources are there, if you have those types of issues, you can cover off those various areas. But you have to go across what provincial boundaries to do it, right? This is a, like, PPE especially is so narrow, it's a wonderful one to partner with the private sector on. It's no question, mm -hmm. because it's so narrow. And you're right, there's distribution centers all across the province, all provinces, right, already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, Atlantic's a great example too, right? Because yep. the majority of the distributors are either in Moncton or, or Halifax. Well, I look at your presentation today, McKesson, yeah. the new quest too that you had there. There's two big distributors in Newfoundland, yet we, we also distribute <laughs> ourselves, right? Which makes no sense. Well, yeah. well, thank you to all of you for the presentation and to all of you for the engaging questions. I will hand it over to you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. We have set an incredibly interesting table for an awful lot of dialogue, and that was my hope. And let me thank all of you for... Um, incredibly meeting my expect exceeding my expectations let me say it that way we are going to break for lunch we are running a little bit behind so if you are okay we may call you back to get underway with our um, afternoon sessions a little bit early uh, meaning the lunch instead of being an hour I think we should shoot for maybe 45 minutes and then we have ample time for drilling down on these really impressive uh, areas of dialogue and opportunity, which is exactly what this community practice is designed to, uh, to get underway with. So thank you, thank you uh, to the panel, to JP. Talk about setting, us, uh, setting an incredible stage for uh, dialogue. Um, have a wonderful lunch, and we'll call you back. We'll give you a signal in about 45 minutes to come back. Thank you.